Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarene, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. Greetings, everybody, and shalom. shalom. And we're gathered here to, today, uh, you know, from some of us are coming from out of town and great distances, and some are right here locally. But I want to welcome all of you, and we most importantly want to welcome the most important one, and that's Yahushua, to be in our midst and to teach us and to guide all of us through uh, this important lesson that he gave us lots of information on. He used one man more so than any other in the first century and we're going to talk about that man and we should pray for him even though we're in another time you can still pray for people that live during their lifetimes you know you can pray for Adam and Kawa the first man and woman and all their descendants which are, we are you know but this man we're going to call him Paul because that seems to be the name that is written in the scriptures as he had to change his name because he became a different person uh, Shaul was his name, the same name as the first king of Israel. Anyway, uh, a lot of things happened that led up to, you know, Yahushua's coming and subsequently the message that he brought and disseminated into the world that we've received through the people that he appointed. And Shaul or Paul was one of those. And it, oddly enough, Shaul was one of the primary persecutors of the Nazarene. We are not serene, living on the earth today, keeping the Torah, the, obeying the commandments of Yahuwah, and holding to the testimony of Yahusha, which is two things, not one. Obeying the commandments and holding to the testimony of Yahusha. And Shaul was a primary persecutor of the Nazarene, and he would be sent out by the uh, Sanhedrin to arrest people who were in the synagogues in remote cities and arrest them because they were blaspheming. And they were blaspheming because they, in their law, that's the uh, Yahudim law that was man-made, it was illegal to pronounce the name of Yahuwah out loud. This shirt was sent to me by a brother, uh, and we'd like to make more of these. It has uh, inf information on the back, too, about the origin of the term L-O-R-D, you know, and how this is the true name. But anyway, uh, Shaul was a persecutor sent out by the Sanhedrin, and one day he was knocked down on the road to Damascus, just about uh, very shortly before he entered the city. And uh, he met someone that changed his life forever. And he became the zealous, well, he became, uh, he was formerly a very zealous persecutor, but then he turned that zeal around and became one of the people who proclaimed the name. Anyway, he was alive during the time the temple stood, you know, prior to 70 CE or AD. And um, I want to read to you one of these things that uh, Yahushua, Yahushua himself gave us to, as a matter of uh, remembering how we shouldn't judge one another. And I'm going to bring out some points in the seminar today that are very, very important about how we treat those who teach us and uh, regard those that have carried the message. In Luke 6, 35, Yahushua said, and do not judge, and you shall not be judged at all. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned at all. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. And that's an element that's in the prayer that he gave the disciples too. Anyway, we're going to start off today. I want to just real briefly run through the screen here um, that um, 
will help uh, those that are watching this on DVD. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, so you guys will have to just read it on your DVD if you're watching from home. We're going to use the tradition, uh, none of the traditional terms. We're going to use their actual name, Yahua and Yahusha, and we're going to use uh, the terms for us, Nazarene. That's what we were called in Acts 24, verse 5. Not this word, that's Greek. Anyway, Yisrael, who they are, and what we are. We're guardians of the name and guardians of the Torah. That's what we do. It's not hard. Now, we use the true personal name, and the reason we don't use terms like G-O-D, for example, is because their orig or origins were in like pagan religions. And uh, the word G-O-D is a common Teutonic word for personal object of religious worship, formerly applicable to superhuman beings of heathen myth. And on conversion of these Teutonic races, this term, G-O-D, became applied to the supreme being. This is just facts. Now, that should upset people enough to where they would say, well, maybe I shouldn't use that word. What word should we use? Well, it's not a name. It's what he is, Elohim. You know, that's the word. Now, we guard the name and we guard the Torah. That's why we're called Nazarene. That's what we're guardians, watchmen, branches of the teachings of Yahushua. Now, in, the, in Luke 11, he gave this disciple's model prayer, and he said, to, uh, he said that his name is Kodesh. That means set apart. You're going to see that word Kodesh later today. Kodesh means set apart. Uh, Christianity has inherited the word holy from that but it means set apart. Your will be done on earth, and that will is his Torah. That's his instructions. Torah is Hebrew for instructions, for those that don't know the, what the word is. These are original Hebrew words that, that the Messiah actually spoke. He would say the word Torah as the instructions. And of course, the, the fathers of the catechetical school would have you understand them to be laws. And they certainly are, because the instructions of Yahuwah would be law, because whatever he utters, we're to live by it, you know, but happily. Some people use extra letters when they transliterate, like the word Yahuwah, the four letters, is sometimes you see a W in it, and the W is a double U. That's a new letter, 13th century or so. We just sort of simplify it, <coughs> use Occam's razor to kind of cut away the unessential entities why have a U and a W when the U does it all by itself? Just say that word out loud and then say that word out loud. It sounds the same. So that's all we're saying. Let's just, uh, let's just <coughs> simplify it a little bit. And uh, then maybe a few generations from now, if Yahuwah tarries, they won't be so confused. And those of you that are watching this can analyze all of this and see that the letter is in the, it's read from the right to the left, yod hey ua hey. Being guardians of the name, that's why we're, we're showing you this. Because this is the first thing we have to introduce people to, is the name. You know. Now here is the retelling of the covenant for the lost tribes, or the scattered tribes, in the last days. And it's given at Deuteronomy 5, starting at verse 6. Number one, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of which is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Number three. You do not cast the name of Yahuwah your Elohim to ruin. Yahuwah, for Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Of course, you all, some of you know the word cast is the Hebrew word nasa, which means to throw. And the word ruin in this text is from the Hebrew word shoah, which means utter destruction or laying waste. To lay waste his name is to not use it. Number four. One of our favorite, the covenant sign, guard the Sabbath day, not a Sabbath, but the Sabbath, to set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work, but the seventh, the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. 
you do not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Now, for those of you that are new, the word in here that you probably don't recognize is Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is the actual word that's written in there in the text instead of the word Egypt. The covenant sign, it, it, it's uh, mentioned in Ezekiel 20 as the covenant sign, this commandment between him and his people forever. Number five, respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Number six, you do not murder. Number seven, you do not break wedlock. Number eight, you do not steal. Number nine, you do not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number 10, you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, nor, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Uh, now, our Catholic friends, centuries ago, changed this uh, into two commandments. The 10th commandment became two because they had wiped out the second commandment about bowing to images. They don't have that one. So it just sort of evaporated so that they got two commandments out of the 10th commandment. Now, changing the laws or the instructions is wormwood. You can't do it. Now, continuing right into no, uh, number, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, Hear, O Yisrael. That means hear and obey. Yahuwah, our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah, your Elohim, with all your heart and with all your being and with, and with all your might. And these words, which I am commanding you today, shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, are they important? Yeah. And uh, that's why we read them. Now, welcome to the discussion on our beloved brother Paul of Tarsus. Now, who knows where the mountain of Ararat is, or the mountains of Ararat is? Has anyone, what's, what country is it in? Turkey. It's in Turkey, that's right. And oddly enough, the mountains of Ararat are significant because that's where Noah's ark landed, and a message came forth from that ark. Now, Paul of Tarsus was born in a city of Tarsus. If, if this was Turkey, right here, right in the middle of the bottom part of it, about 20 kilometers from the ocean, is a little city called Tarsus. That little city now has almost 3 million people living there. It's uh, Islamic now because of the failure of, you know, the people that, you know, were supposed to carry the message all over and retain the truth. But anyway, that little city was a very important cr crossroads for travelers and a lot of different languages. And, and he was uh, born there. And then he went to Jerusalem, or Jerusalem to study under a teacher named Gamaliel, very significant member of the Sanhedrin. You know? Now, Paul's writings for a long time, for centuries and centuries, have been used as a hammer to stamp out those that would keep their commandments. Nobody would deny that. They'd say that Paul said this and Paul said that. I've learned a lot from Paul. I learned from Paul personally in my early studies that I have to infiltrate the Gentiles to become like them in order that some of them might be saved. And I've been highly criticized for that. And so was he. But uh, I also learned many other things from Paul. I learned that he was pro-Torah. He wasn't anti-Torah. And nowadays, they're attacking Paul among the Nazarim. He was a Nazar, a Nazar himself. But he, they're attacking him because somehow 
the adversary has invaded our ranks and started to teach false teachings about him. And we're not supposed to bash our, our teachers. But here, here he says in Romans 3, 31, do we then nullify the Torah through the belief or the faith? Let it not be. On the contrary, we establish the Torah. Now, how could a man that wrote those words be interpreted in the wrong way? Well, you see, they're misunderstanding the difference between the moral laws that are forever and the ceremonial laws of the priesthood that were passing away, you see? But that's how they trick us. Now, our beloved Paul carried the message in three, basically three huge journeys down the long and winding road. And that, here's the third journey of Paul right here on this map. And we're not talking about another Paul. The other Paul was rumored to be dead, but Paul really is dead. This one is still alive as I'm recording this. And he was supposedly replaced by an imposter, but that's all lies. They did that as a promotion because, see, recording artists usually only last three or four years. And after a time, they had to kick this, kick start it again. So they started this rumor. Okay, that's all that was. Anyway, a little fun to keep you awake. Now, this is the setup, okay? I want to explain this to you. Right now, Paul is being attacked. His reputation, his writings, everything that Paul did. Now, when you attack a teacher like Moshe, Moshe was Moses, okay? And some men rose up, Korah, Dothan, and Abiram, and they're followers, and they wanted to attack Moshe's authority. And yet Moshe was given a, a mission to accomplish by Yahuwah. And Korah was, and his little friends were, you know, th that's a serious thing. When you uh, confront someone and criticize them that are given a, mis a mission and then turn on them and fight against them, you're fighting against Yahuwah. And the ground opened up on these men and swallowed all of their wives and children and little ones and all their household goods, everything that belonged to them, and then it closed back up over them. Now that's a, a sign for us. We've got to be paying attention. Now here's what the setup is. Right now, this is an example of several emails that I've received, and many people are out there writing books about Paul, bashing him on technical misunderstandings. Now here's what they said in the email. We are committed to pray for you as you are still following some of the traditions of man and are followers of Paul. And we find that it's a slam dunk that Paul is a false apostle. Paul is not endorsed by Yahushua, but he warned us to beware of him. That's Paul. There are way too many scriptures that we could share that show or prove this about Paul. We cannot believe that it has taken 50 to 60 years to see all of this. But it was when we began to keep the true lunar Sabbath, the feasts, according to the scriptures, and we learned his name and his son's name, that our eyes were opened to these truths, and to that we are humbled. Now, in this email, what's the first and most important thing to these people? The lunar Sabbath which is not found in the scriptures. You see this? Now, somehow, they've been taken away from the truth and wandered from the faith. They're keeping another Sabbath. Now, a lot of you don't know what a lunar Sabbath is. Well, it's some new thing that's just started. It's never been heard of before. Now, when we malign the messenger who is sent to teach, the message is also maligned that he or she carries. Because if you malign the messenger, then everything that they would have to tell you is blocked. What if you had to throw out everything that Paul wrote in the scriptures? It would be enormous. Now, it's slanderous to do so. Every word will be held accountable that we utter. Now, there was a division over Yahushua himself first, before there was a division between his followers. Now, li listen to what these people were saying. Now, this is... Uh, there was much grumbling among the crowds concerning him. They're speaking of Yahushua. Some were saying, he's a good man. Others were saying, no. On the contrary, he leads the people astray. Well, they're saying that about Paul. 
They're saying that about a lot of the leaders today that are teaching the truth. Now, here's a list over here of some books that uh, we are pretty sure that Shaw, or Paul wrote. You know, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Uh, he was involved in the book of Acts because it's mostly about him and Luke. Luke is the writer. And you also have to call into question the uh, fact that Luke was hanging around with this supposed false apostle. So you have to discount his writings as well. And also, the people who met with him in the, in the book of Acts, which is recorded in, uh, what is it, chapter 15, and uh, they all met together, and Yehuda was there, and Peter, and uh, Yehusha's bro half-brother, Yaakov. They're all, you know, in, in called into question, too, by these same people, these Lunar Sabbath people. Not all, are, are, are all the people who reject Paul are Lunar Sabbathers, but... At any rate, this represents a moral revolt, a moral revolt against the set-apart words or the Kodesh words that were transmitted, that were Elohim breathed through this man, Shaul, or Paul. And it's causing desolation to that which is Kodesh. So when something that is Kodesh is desolated, it's an abomination of desolation, you know. Now, is the fruit, or is what we're perceiving, is the fruit knowledge, or is it love? Well, read the, the background motivation in the person that's carrying any message to you. If they're, if they're angry, or if they're loving. If they're supportive, or if they're trying to tear down, okay? Now, I'm not trying to tear people down, but I am going to give an anthropomorphic image to some of the doctrines. Okay, and the, I don't mean to make the people themselves look like beasts, but the teachings are beasts. They're like wolves, you know. So we can't throw our brothers under the bus. Now, Yahushua prayed for the emissaries, that's the apostles, and those who would believe through their word, okay? In uh, Yahukanan or John chapter 17, he said, and I do not pray for these alone, but also for those believing in me through their word so that they all might be one as you father are in me and I in you so that they too might be one in us so that the world might believe that you have sent me you know now look at this there's 27 <laughs> books in the canon of what we call the brief Kaddishah and what they call the New Testament and of those 27 books, 13, wasn't it? Yeah, were written by this one man. Now that's almost half. You know, 26 books would be, 13 would be half of that. But you see, he's written about half of the books. And he, of the actual words, he wrote 31.57% at least. And that doesn't include the book of Hebrews, which many of us believe he did write. Because the author of Hebrews says he was in chains as he was writing. So who would that be, you know? Now, add to this the 28 chapters of Acts. 28 chapters of Acts, written by Luke, to Theophilus. Theophilus was apparently someone that he also wrote his own gospel to, which recorded the travels of Paul and Luke together, you know? Now, the attack upon our beloved brother Paul, I keep calling him our beloved brother Paul, because that is the phrase that's used about him by other writers like Peter. Today, many who are being restored to the covenant and at the same time hearing teachings that are carefully formulated to con condemn Paul of Tarsus, formerly named Shaul, they're being, he's being accused for this reason. Uh, he's accused of being a, a false apostle or a heretic. Uh, I'm gonna show you what they're, uh, they're accusing him of first. The accusations are these. They actually have said that Paul, when he was struck down on the road to Damascus, as he was breathing threats against the Nazarene to arrest them for uttering the name out loud, that he was struck down by Shatan, not Yahushua. How blasphemous is that? In Acts chapter 9, you can read this whole story. And in that same chapter, 
the uh, fellow that was to immerse Paul, Hananiah, they call him Ananias, he was also talking to Shatan too. He wasn't talking to Yahushua. Is that, is that just messed up? Now, if he met Shatan, then why does it say he met Yahushua? You know, was Luke recording error? Well, this would mean that Luke was wrong too, you know. But these people are just making this stuff up. Now, if you state that the activity of the spirit of Yahuwah is actually that of a demon, what is that? That's the unpardonable sin. You've done it. You have done something that will never be forgiven, especially when that goes out in book form and, and emails and you're just telling people this stuff and, uh, and, it, and it changes people. It has an effect on them and then they turn away from a brother, you know. Blasphemy against the set-apart spirit represents identifying what has happened as a, some miracle, possibly, and you're saying that wasn't by the Ruach HaKodesh or the spirit of Yahuwah. That was done by a demon. Now, if you say that out loud, your words have condemned you because if it really was, that's why it's better to be silent about it and say, I don't know. You know, that's what I usually do. You know, because Yahuwah can work in many different ways. We can't just call that which is set apart mindlessly and identify it and flippantly uh, describe what, it, what we think it is and then go on. We have to be very careful about that. Now today, as Paul's letters, now see, Paul's letters were used as a, as a hammer against the Torah. You know, here's what Paul said, and they're misinterpreting Paul all the time to get you to not obey. They do it all the time. Today, as Paul's letters are more accurately understood, the dragon is attempting to deceive those who may read his writings and see that this emissary promoted Torah keeping. In the past, Paul's letters were twisted and misunderstood through the teachings of those posing as messengers of light. And it was very effective because people didn't read scripture generally. But you see, knowledge is increasing now. And the people that can read for themselves are finding out. The accusers of Paul are siding with the Pharisees, those who caused his arrest and ultimate execution. They fail to recognize some points, and many more than this, too. But Paul was sent to Rome. It may look like he requested it, but he was sent there. And look at what, what the reason is. He was chained to Roman soldiers, and their primary religion was the sun worship of the Roman Empire. It was a Roman soldier religion, you know. The message of deliverance was sent out among those who would hear, and Paul's knowledge of diverse languages enabled him and made him the perfect emissary for the task. The road system of Rome was perfect to carry the message to every corner of the empire. See, all these things are just basically the framework that set him up to become the most, the greatest emissary of all. Not that it is against uh, or lifting him up any higher than Yahushua. Yahushua was in, in him, you see, and doing his work through Brother Paul. Now, <clears throat> Yahushua told Hananiah, or Ananias, that Shaul would suffer for his name. Because, see, he was killing Nazarene. He was having them arrested and drugged back to the Sanhedrin, and then they would say the name, and then they were taken out and killed, stoned, whatever. And he was just in grief about this after he repented and met Yahushua. But um, he says that he would suffer for his name. And he declared him to be a chosen vessel in Acts chapter 9. Now Hananiah had a conversation with Yahushua about Paul, who at that time was still called Shaul. Here's what happened in Acts chapter 9. And Hananiah answered saying, because he had told him to go and, and, and receive Paul, uh, Shaul. Master, I've heard from many about this man, how many evils he did to your set-apart ones in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all those calling on your name. But the master said to him, that's Yahushua speaking, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before nations, sovereigns, and the children of Israel." For I shall show him how much he has to suffer for my name. Now, Peter 
who is one of the eyewitnesses, he says this about uh, Paul's letters that are hard to understand. So then, beloved ones, looking forward to this, do your utmost to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and reckon the patience of our master as deliverance, as also our beloved brother Shaul wrote to you, according to the wisdom given to him, as also in all his letters, speaking in them concerning these matters in which some are hard to understand. Paul's letters are hard to understand. Which those who are untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do also the other scriptures. Other scriptures. You then, beloved ones, being forewarned, watch lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the delusion of the lawless. But grow in the favor and knowledge of our Master and Savior, Yahushua Messiah. To him be the esteem both now and in a day that abides. Amen. Now the accusers today are saying that he was knocked down by a blinding light on the way to Damascus. But, and they're saying it wasn't Yahushua who spoke with him, as, as I mentioned earlier, but rather the adversary, the dragon. All of this is heretical, slanderous talk, and it would be from the perspective of those who are on a path of error that's greater than any we've ever encountered in the history of the faith. This is an attack, a moral attack, on the writings themselves. And that's pretty serious. Attacking the servants of Yahushua from among our own members is exactly what Yahushua and Paul told us would occur. It's a lack of love. And this would mean that Hananiah also spoke to a demonic spirit because, you know, Yahushua was talking to both of them. Now, that's wrong. It wasn't a demonic spirit. It was Yahushua. Acts 9 continues, and it, it, well, it, st it starts off basically saying, in this descript description of his uh, encounter with Yahushua, Shaul was still breathing threats. And it came to be that as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light flashed around him from the heaven. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Shaul, Shaul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you, Master? And the Master said, I am Yahushua, whom you persecute. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Mm. Now, Shaul was given the right hand of fellowship by the pillars, the chief believers, the, the apostles. In Galatians 2, the recorded word says, So when Yaakob, Kepha, and Yahukanan, that's, that's uh, James, Peter, and John, who seem to be supports, that's the, that means that they're the main three, came to know the favor that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnaba the right hand of fellowship in order that we go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised, only that we might remember the poor, which I myself was e eager to do. Now, if we throw Paul under the bus, we have to also throw Kepha, Jacob, and Yahukanan, Titus, Barnaba, Luke, Yehuda, Sila, and many others as well. If they are all beguiled, if all of those people were beguiled, why is there no record from those not beguiled to report that Paul was a heretic? Where is the writing? Because he's not a heretic. I kind of like that guy. Now this is a little uh, depiction of some of the distortion. I, it's a cartoon I drew many years ago. And it's got uh, Paul depicted as a shapeshifter. He's becoming a Roman Catholic priest. And he's standing next to his buddy, his traveling companion, his brother in arms, uh, Father Luke, uh, Father Paul and Father Luke. They're dressed up like priests. If Shaul and Luke celebrated Halloween and dressed up as, ha as a Roman Catholic clergy, they might say this. After we light the candles, let's go make some more holy water and kiss some of those relics that we stashed in the altar. It's just craziness. But they do this stuff, you know. Anyway, the, I'm not making fun of men. I'm just saying, what, how could they possibly say such a thing? Anyway, the dispute in Jerusalem over how Gentiles engraft into Israel through the faith in Yahushua. Now, this is something that 
most Christians never get. They read the words, but they don't get it. Now, please bear with me. I've got four frames like this, and I'm gonna, some of these things are going to pop right out at you. Acts 15. And some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees rose up, saying it's necessary to circumcise these men, or these people, and to command them to keep the Torah of Moshe. And the emissaries and elders came together. Okay, that's the emissaries and elders. To look into this matter, and when there had been much dispute, Kepha rose up, that's Peter, and said to them, Men, brothers, you know what a good while ago, that a good while ago, you, Elohim chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the good news and believe. And Elohim, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the set-apart spirit, as also to us, and made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by belief. Remember when he went to Cornelius' house, you know, with the three men and the three sheets and all that? That's what Peter's referring to. Now then, why do you try, that means test, Elohim, by putting a yoke on the neck of the taught ones, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But through the favor of the master, Yahushua Messiah, we trust to be saved in the same way as they. Okay. And all the crowd was silent and were listening to Barnaba and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders Elohim did. It wasn't Shatan, it was Elohim. Did among the Gentiles through them. Okay, they're miracle workers, but Yahuwah is working miracles through them. <clears throat> and after they were silent, Yaakov, now that's Yahushua's half-brother, you know, they call James, answered saying, men, brothers, listen to me. Shimon, that's, that's Peter, or Kepha, has declared how Elohim first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this, as it has been written, after this I shall return and rebuild the booth of Daud, that's David, which has fallen down. And I shall rebuild its ruins and I shall set it up so that the remnant of mankind sh shall seek Yahuwah, even all the Gentiles on whom my name has been called, says Yahuwah, who is doing all this, who made this known from of old. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to Elohim, but that we write to them to abstain from the defilements of idols and from whoring and from what is strangled and from blood. Now those things are done in, in pagan temples. All of these things are, are, are activities that occurred as pagan worship. You know. From the ancient generations, Moshe has, that's Moses, in every city those proclaiming him, that's the Torah being read, and Moshe's five books, then it seemed to be good to the emissaries and the elders with all the assembly to send chosen men from among them to Antioch with Paul and Barnaba. <coughs> Yehuda, being called Barsaba, and Sila, leading men among the brothers, having written by their hand this, the emissaries and the elders and the brothers to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Kalikia, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your lives, to whom we gave no command, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnaba and Paul, men who have given up their lives for the name of our master Yehusha Messiah. We have therefore sent Yehuda and Sila, who are also confirming this by word of mouth. Okay, do you see Paul in there? Yeah. Now, that's pretty clear. And here's where the rubber meets the road, right here. You can almost hear the bump on those tires. For it seemed good to the set-apart spirit and to us. Okay, who's the set-apart spirit? Well, it's the spirit of the son of Yahushua. I mean, it is Yahushua. It's the spirit of the son of, the son of Elohim. The spirit is in us, the son of Yehusha dwells in us. Now, to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessities, that you abstain from what is offered to idols and blood and what is strangled and whoring. If you keep yourselves from these, you shall do well. Be strong. They therefore, being sent off, went to Antioch. And having gathered the crowd together, they delivered the letter. And having read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. And Yehuda and Sila, being themselves also <laughs> prophets, encouraged the brothers with many words and strengthened them. Now, you have to understand what they were really doing there was adult males were expected 
to be circumcised in order to be saved. And they now immersion is our outward sign of our belief of our of our deliverance. But you see, uh, they were still insisting upon that. Now we're to circumcise our newborn male children. That is true. We still do that. But adult males who are converting are not expected to do that. Paul warned us more than any other emissary about divisions and envy and slander and false doctrines. There was no other emissary that even came close. This is why he is being attacked and accused of being a false follower of Yahushua. Yahushua and Paul warned us about wolves among us, both of them. And here's what Yahushua said. Matthew 7 says, But beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are savage wolves. Romans 16, Paul writes this, Now I call upon you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and stumbling, contrary to the teaching which you learned, and turn away from them. And then in Acts 20, he says this to the elders, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves shall come in among you, not sparing the, fo- the flock. And also from among yourselves, men shall arise speaking distorted teachings to draw away the taught ones after themselves. And this is accomplished later on by, in fact, by the uh, sophistry. Now we're going to study the words sophist and sophistry. That's a Greek term that means wisdom or wise or clever person. Now, we're going to find out about them, and they became the Nicolaitans. Anyway, they have an entire architecture of deceit that they they built upon. Be careful what you say about the brothers of the faith, especially those that are on a mission that was given to them. Now, in the book of Yehuda, they call Jude, this was a half-brother also of Yehusha. He was one of the brothers of Yehusha's family. Now, in chapter 1, verse 8 through 19, it says, In the same way, indeed, these dreamers defile the flesh and reject authority and speak evil of esteemed ones. But Michael, the chief messenger in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moshe, presumed not to bring against him a blasphemous accusation, but said, Yahuwah rebuke you. But these blaspheme that which, which they do not know. Now, he's talking about people that accuse brothers and sisters, maybe, of things that are not true, like they're doing to Paul now. And that which they know naturally, like unreasoning beasts, and these they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, because they have gone in the way of Cain. Now, who's Cain? Cain is the son of Adam. He's the one that slew his brother out of jealousy and envy. And gave themselves to the delusion of Bilam, and for a reward, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now, Korah, I mentioned earlier, the earth swallowed him up, and his family and other families that had risen up against Moshe. And uh, that's recorded in Numbers chapter 16, if you want to read about it. And it's for our example. You know, we can't just rise up against people who are on a mission from Yahuwah. Now, in Jude 1, it continues saying this, these people, these are rocky reefs in your love feasts. They're feasting with you, feeding themselves without fear, waterless clouds borne about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots and wild waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, straying stars for whom blackness of darkness is kept forever. And Hanok, that's Enoch, Hanok, The seventh from Adam also prophesied of these, saying, See, Yahuwah comes with his myriads of set-apart ones to execute judgment on all, to punish all who are wicked among them concerning all their wicked works, which they have committed in a wicked way, and concerning all the harsh words which wicked sinners have spoken against him. Now, we're defiled by what comes out of our mouths, you see. And when you hear someone bringing something out of their mouth and you don't notice that that's defiling them, and it also defiles you if you listen to it, you need to just stop listening and just say, please, say no more, you know. Now, these are grumblers, complainers, who walk according to their own lusts, and their mouth speaks proudly. 
In other words, they're better than the person that they're criticizing. These people that are accusing Paul, they're better than Paul. They're accomplishing much more. They speak proudly, admiring faces of others for the sake of gain. But you, beloved ones, remember the words spoken before by the emissaries of our master, Yahushua Messiah, because they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own wicked lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, not having the spirit. What are they saying? There would be mockers in the last time. Well, the, what are they mocking? They're mocking Paul and his writings and his work. Now, when we uh, sometimes misinterpret things, sometimes presentations that we've made on YouTube have been misinterpreted by people. Uh, over here we see the lunar Sabbath man represented. It's not a person, it's a doctrine. This doctrine is being portrayed or personified. See, if you took something and turned it into a person, and you wanted to, ex exam you know, it's not, it's an intangible, then that's fine, you know. Anthropomorphic illustrations, that's what they are. They can portray doctrines, but not real individuals. If you personify something, you, the definition of personify means to attribute human nature or character to an inanimate object or an abstraction, as in speech or writing. So imposters who teach false doctrines and desiccate the, the thing that's set apart, you have to make some kind of powerful illustration of what that doctrine really looks like. Like I've got the, uh, I am the egg man, cuckoo ca -choo here, which is uh, just there for fun, don't worry about that. You've got wolves, they're not really wolves, are they? You know, they're not really wolves, but they are like savage wolves. The desolator of you who is weak would be uh, uh, kind of uh, depicted as a, you know, a wolf man, because the wolf man is kind of associated with the moon, you know? Anyway, uh, consulters of wizards. You can't mix your religious faith, you know, or your faith with religions. Your faith is a foundation based on truth, not religion, you know? Uh, it's not a process that you have to go through other people. To, you can have direct access to Yahushua. Uh, it's not about an organized religion. It's not about uh, building a bunch of... Uh, uh, religions from parts. See, that's what these two represent. In other words, uh, Christianity is really a summary of all these pagan parts that were all put together and it's up walking around. You know, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good illustration or not, but it's not about a person, it's about, a, about, about doctrines, you know. Now, the danger of maligning an elder who's given a mission, here's the danger. Number 16 tells you the whole story. The sin of Korah. Korah and Dothan and Abiram, I believe it was, and their families, they rose up against the authority of Moshe, questioning his mission, and they were causing a stumbling block for the whole people of Israel. And for this, Yahuwah said to Moshe, tell all the children of Israel to, to, to move back away from these three men and their families. And then the earth opened up and just swallowed them all, all their households, everything that belonged to them, they closed back up over them. Also, Proverbs 6, verses 12 through 19 says, A man of Belial, a wicked man, walks with a perverse mouth, winks with his eyes, shuffles his feet, points with his fingers, perverseness is in his heart, plotting evil at all times. He sends out strife. Therefore, his calamity comes suddenly. Instantly he is broken and there is no healing. These six matters Yahuwah hates, and seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands shedding innocent blood, a heart devising wicked schemes, feet quick to run to evil, and a false witness breathing out lies, and one who causes strife among brothers. That means division. Proverbs 18 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those loving it eat its fruit. So we, what we speak with our mouth can cause death in, in the lives of others. Now, this uh, situation started with Paul when he was arrested um, for his protection, basically, if you read the whole story of Paul. And there was a sophist. Now, we talked about the word sophist. 
you're going to have to understand that these people are hired guns. They're, they're speakers that are meant to change your opinion. You know, I'm not trying to change your opinion with anything but scripture. So it's not my opinion. And uh, anyway, here's the way it works. The words of this man named Tertullus, and we'll read about it in Acts chapter 24. Acts 24, Tertullus was, was hired to go speak to this man, Felix, who was in charge of Paul's you know, arrest. And he was trained in the art of, be, of public speaking in order to sway public opinion. He accused Paul of being a deceiver and a conveyor of propaganda and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarim. That's what it says in the, in the text. He's not a ringleader of the sect of the Christians. He's a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarim. Acts 24, 5 says, For having found this man a plague, this is Tertullus speaking about Paul, who stirs up dissension among all the Yahudim throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarene, who also tried to profane the set-apart place, and whom we seized and wished to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came along and with much violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. And by examining him yourself, you shall be able to know all these matters of which we accuse him. Now that law was not that he was referring to is not the Torah. That was their own human made, man-made law about not uttering the name. Because see, remember Shaul was the one appointed by the Sanhedrin initially to go out and get these Nazarene who, who were pronouncing the name. And then he became one. <laughs> anyway, sophistry. It's a method of persuasion. Okay? And it's a Greek thing, really. Sophist is a Greek word. Sophie means, or Sophia means wisdom or cleverness. Now, they usually use a three-point method. You hear all these speakers, polit politicians, and, politicians and preachers both use the same methods because they use public speaking. I'm, I'm speaking in public, but I have absolutely no training at all. And neither did Paul. Paul really wasn't a, a, a trained speaker at all. In fact, he, in his writings, he says, I'm kind of bashful or, or, or timid when I'm with you in person. But when I'm writing to you, I'm very bold. You know. Anyway, the three-point method in speech, to simplify it down, th they say, tell them what you're going to tell them, and then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. That, that's an oversimplification, but uh, anyway, they do have usually three points, and sometimes they'll use the same letter to, at, to, at the beginning of what they're trying to tell you, uh, which really means that they haven't really got much to tell you. But the dialectical method is a dialogue between two or more people holding different points of view about a subject and who wish to establish the truth of the matter by dialogue with reasoned arguments. But a so, uh, the sophists weren't interested in truth. The sophists taught the artistic quality was much more important than the truth. They didn't, care, they didn't really care about facts. They were more interested in the quality of the presentation, you know, how loud you spoke, how you emphasized things, and how much passion you put into it. And the person that was speaking may have not even believed a word they were saying. You know, like a lot of politicians, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you that. I'm going to, man, it's going to be great. It's going to be utopia. The sophists taught, taught artistic quality in oratory, which is motivation via, spe via the speech, as the primary goal. He wanted to motivate the, the listeners, like the Nazis, you know. Uh, oratory was taught as an art form, used to please and to influence other people by way of excellence in speech in order to persuade. Now, it's all mind control is what it is. That's the goal. And uh, artistic quality was more vital than truth. Now, Tertullus is illustrated here by an artist standing before Felix in Acts chapter 24. The word Sophia, as I said, was the word wisdom. And a sophist is a person who's wise or clever. And it came to mean one who gives intellectual instruction for pay. They paid Tertullus to come speak to Felix. He was just a hired gun. And it contrasted with a philosopher. A philosopher is somebody that does care about truth. Anyway, the, the, the term sophist became a term of contempt. 
Ancient sophists were famous for their clever, specious arguments. We're going to learn a new word. Specious means pleasing to the eye, but deceptive. Plausible, but not true. It sounds plausible, but it's not true. Uh, this is a little picture of some recent uh, photos taken from my own high school, where I went, where I was trained by Jesuits, who were sophists. And they're wearing their sophist costumes. That's what they look like. And this Greek hat that you see that people graduate with, that's the hat, that's the domed hat of H-E-R-M-E-S, a Greek deity of Sophia, or wisdom. He's the Greek deity of wisdom, H-E-R-M-E-S. That's his hat. The mortar board had to do with the building. You know, that's where masons get their thing. But uh, the dome part is the deity's hat. And that's why the little beanie that people see a lot of Yehudi wear, that was imposed upon them by Antiochus Epiphanes, a Greek ruler that was in the land. Anyway, they have no real knowledge of that fact, but uh, it's just a, a horrible thing to be seeing. But uh, anyway, that's my old school. It's a Jesuit school. Now, uh, the sophistry is a subtle, tricky, superficially plausible, but generally fallacious method of reasoning, okay? And they will stone you uh, if uh, you t start talking the truth. Now, to make themselves feel more righteous, they, they, they tear other people down to lift themselves up. In, in 2 Corinthians 11, it says, five times I received from the Yahudim 40 stripes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was, I've been in the deep, in many travels, in dangers of water, in dangers of robbers, in dangers on my own race, and so forth. See, he's worried about the, he, he's anxious for the assemblies. He doesn't care about himself at all. This man was giving, okay? Why would anybody feel like he was trying to make himself somebody? He wasn't. You know, now stoning is a very, very important, uh, very uh, horrible type of death. You hear about the Islamic people killing women by stoning all the time just because they get some kind of impression about them. And Matthew chapter 12, we read Yahushua's words saying this. Now, this has relevance to Paul too because you have to understand Paul was sent by Yahushua, he was commissioned. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Because of this I say to you, all sin and blasphemy which shall be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven men. And whoever speaks a word against the son of Adam, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the set-apart Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. Either make the good tree either make the tree good and its, and its fruit good, or make the tree rotten and its fruit rotten, for a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of adders, how are you able to speak what is good, being wicked? So every tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. So people that read Paul can have an eye of darkness or an eye of light. You can look at Paul's writings and say, oh, this is definitely saying we don't have to obey. But it's not saying that. You know. Now it says, continuing, it says, for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. The good man brings forth what is good from the good treasures of his heart. And the wicked man brings forth what is wicked from the wicked treasure. And I say to you that for every, for every idle word men speak, they shall give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you shall be declared righteous. And by your words, you shall be declared unrighteous. Paul tells us to put away all bitterness towards one another. Ephesians 4, 29 starts out saying, Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for the use of building up, so as to impart what is pleasant to the hearers. And do not grieve the set-apart spirit of Elohim, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and displeasure and uproar and slander be put away from you, along with all evil, and be kind towards one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as Elohim also forgave you and Messiah. Just read Philippians chapter 4 or 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 
and tell me if that's not the heart of Yahuwah. Paul was accused of violating Torah by the Yahudim over uttering the name aloud. Now, Acts 18 starts out saying this. Now, this is when he was arrested and so forth and uh, held, and they were accusing him of saying the name. Now, notice that the real accusation involved the name. When Galleon was proconsul of Achaia, the Yahudim with one mind rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat saying, this one does seduce men to worship Elohim contrary to the Torah. He was saying that he was calling on the name is what he was doing. And as Paul was about to open his mouth, Galleon said to the Yahudim, if it were a matter of wrongdoing of, or wicked recklessness, O oh, Yahudim, there would be a reason why I should bear with you. But if it is a question of words and names and a law that is with, among you, see to that yourselves. For I do not wish to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. They were, he was saying, what? You can't say a word. You know, he's speaking a word that you don't like. <laughs> Acts 9 continues and says, and the master said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight. Now, who's he talking to? Well, he's talking to Hananiah. And seek in the house of Yehuda for one name called Shaul of Tarsus. For look, he is praying and has seen in a vision a man named Hananiah coming in and laying his hands on him, or his hand on him, so as to see again. And Hananiah answered, saying, Master, I have heard from many about this man, how many evils he did to your set-apart ones in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all those calling on your name. But the master said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before nations, sovereigns, and the children of Israel, for I shall show him how much he has to suffer for my name. Now, we did this twice. I already did this. But it's so important to understand that it's about his name. Yahuwah wants us to know and to use his name. In Yeshayahu, or who they call Isaiah, 42.8, this is a very important text. Always remember this. I am Yahuwah. That is my name. And my esteem I do not give to another, nor my praise to idols. And here's a study chart for those that are watching this on DVD. At first, Paul was not trusted among the Nazarene in Damascus. Because when he showed up in Damascus and he started to talk to them, they didn't trust him. And all who heard were amazed and said, is this not the one, or is this not he who destroyed those calling on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for, for this to take them bound to the chief priests? So anyway, Paul wasn't proclaiming himself. He was proclaiming Yahusha, which is what we do, you know. 2 Corinthians 4, therefore having this service, even as we received compassion, we do not lose heart, but have renounced the secret ways of shame, not walking in craftiness nor falsifying the word of Elohim, but by the manifestation of the truth, recommending ourselves to every human conscience in the sight of Elohim. And indeed, if our message has been veiled, it has been veiled in those who are perishing, in whom the mighty one of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that the enlightening of the message of the esteem of Messiah, who is the likeness of Elohim, does not shine on men. Now, Shaul enlightened the words of Messiah. He enlightened them. He expanded on them. For we do not proclaim ourselves, but Messiah Yahushua, the Master, and ourselves your servants for the sake of Yahushua. And the Spirit of the Son is in our hearts. Galatians, he wrote this too. And because you are sons, Elohim has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. In Acts 9, Yahushua's words again, for I shall show him how much he has to suffer for my name. And he, he, he had to put these things on, and he was chained to two Roman soldiers and led, or, led around and, and jailed. And uh, that doesn't sound like he was out making a name for himself, but from that prison, wherever he might have been, he wrote these letters to all these different assemblies. And it was for our benefit. 
And Paul wrote these words in Romans 2. For not the hearers of the Torah are righteous in the sight of Elohim, but the doers of the Torah shall be declared right. Uh, that's Willie Nelson, by the way. Anyway, it's kind of a contrast when you look at this, uh, these words that these men today who are at the highest levels of the world and they're standing before the United Nations and saying these things. Uh, that's really ridiculous. If I had an opportunity to talk to the United Nations, would I talk like that? No. Neither would Yahusha. Not that I would put myself in that rank, but if Shaul could speak to the United Nations, I don't think he would say that. <laughs> you know. But um, our commission, as Paul's commission was, and he did it so well, is in order to teach righteousness to the nations. And Matthew 28 says this, therefore go and make taught ones, that's disciples, students of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set apart spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen. So we have to teach them the name, and we have to teach them to obey. It says right there, to guard all that we, have, we were commanded to obey. And if you pick and choose which one of the commandments you want to obey, then you're, then you're losing it. Someone else is deceiving you. Or if they start shuffling the commandments around, you know, like we talked about earlier, like let's split this one into two and wipe that one out. How, how about that? There's trickery afoot for sure. And number six, I want to take time to do this for you. I want to place the blessing upon you. And Yahuwah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aharon and to his son, saying, This is how you bless the children of Israel. Say to them, Yahuwah bless you and guard you, and make his face shine upon you and show favor to you. Yahuwah lift up his face upon you and give you shalom. Thus they shall put my name on the children of Israel, and I myself shall bless them. Mm. So when our hearts beat in time with Yahushua's heart, we love what he loves. And, all, and, and that would have to include all those he is redeeming. So if we don't love those that he's redeemed, then we might not be one of the redeemed. So we have to love Brother Paul, you know, and pray for Brother Paul. You can do that. Even though we're different parts in time, we, we were prayed for in the, in the past by Yahushua, and you, you can bet that the emissaries prayed for us too. But we can pray for them, you know. Keep the covenant and love for one another burning in your heart. Baruch haba b'shem Yahuwah. That's all I have for today.